Fire Alarm by Michael Lowey. This is part four of chapter one. So thesis 12. We need history, but our need for it differs from that of the jaded idlers in the garden of knowledge. That was a quotation from On the Advantages and Disadvantages of History for Life by Nietzsche. The subject of historical knowledge is the struggling, oppressed class itself. Marx presents it as the last enslaved class, the avenger that completes the task of liberation in the name of generations of the downtrodden. This conviction, which had a brief resurgence in the Spartacus League, has always been a bit objectionable to social democrats. Within three decades, they managed to erase the name of Blanky almost entirely, though at the sound of that name, the preceding century had quaked. The Social Democrats preferred to cast the working class in the role of a redeemer of future generations, in this way cutting the sinews of its greatest strength. This indoctrination made the working class forget both its hatred and its spirit of sacrifice, for both are nourished by the image of enslaved ancestors rather than by the ideal of liberated grandchildren. The epigraph is from the Nietzsche text we have mentioned several times already. The quotation contains only the critical part, but it is interesting to consider the alternative he offers in the rest of his 1873 essay. According to Nietzsche, history, in the sense of historiography, must not be a luxury, a casual stroll, or a matter of archaeological curiosity, but must be of use in the present. We need history for life and action. He describes his considerations on history as untimely because they act against the age and so have an effect on the age to the advantage. It is to be hoped of a coming age. These remarks match Benjamin's intentions perfectly. The first sentence here on the subject of knowledge is reminiscent of an idea that runs through the principal writings of Rosa Luxemburg. Class consciousness and therefore knowledge is the product above all of the practice of struggle, of the active experience of the working class. This is clearly distinct from the proposition common to Karl Kotsky and to Lenin in what is to be done that regards knowledge or socialist consciousness as something which has to be introduced into the class from outside by intellectuals and theorists. There is nothing to suggest that Benjamin read the writings of Rosa Luxemburg that Benjamin read the writings of Rosa Luxemburg. He does not quote them anywhere, but he doubtless learned of her ideas from the presentation George Lucas made of them in several chapters of history and class consciousness. It is in this, it is in this same work whose importance in Benjamin's conversion to Marxism we are already aware of, that we find a second possible meaning of thesis 12. I have in mind Lucas's polemic against the conception of historical materialism as neutral scientific knowledge proposed by the theorists of social democracy, Karl Kotsky and Rudolf Hilferding. According to history and class consciousness, Marxism represents a higher form of knowledge because it adopts the class standpoint of the proletariat which is both the subject of historical action and the subject of knowledge. Benjamin's text repeats passages from Lucas almost verbatim, and we might wonder whether when he writes Marx in Thesis 12, we should not perhaps read Lucas. The last class to struggle against oppression and the class charged, according to, Luke, uh, according to Marx, with the task of liberation, the proletariat, cannot, in Benjamin's view, fulfill that role if it forgets its martyred ancestors. There can be no struggle for the future without a memory of the past. This is the theme of the redemption of the victims of history, which we have already met in Thesis 2, 3, and 4 in its dual theological and political sense. Benjamin's stress on defeated ancestors may seem surprising. It is doubtless too unilateral insofar as the struggle against oppression takes its inspiration equally from the victims of the past and from hopes for the generations to come.
and also, if not predominantly, from solidarity with, with present generations. It puts one in mind of the Jewish imperative. Zakir, remember. Remember your ancestors who were slaves in Egypt, massacred by Amalek, exiled to Babylon, enslaved by Titus, burnt alive by the Crusaders, and murdered in the pogroms. We encounter this cult of martyrs in another form in Christianity, which made a crucified prophet its messiah and his tortured disciples its saints. But the workers' movement itself has followed this paradigm in entirely secular form. Faithfulness to the memory of the Chicago martyrs, the syndicalists and anarchists executed in a parody of justice by the American authorities in 1887, inspired the ritual of May Day through, throughout the 20th century, and we know how important the memory of the murders of Karl Lipnicht and Rosa Luxemburg in 1919 was for the communist movement in its early years. But it is perhaps Latin America that provides the most impressive example of the inspirational role of past victims, if one thinks of the place such figures as Jose Mar Marti, Emiliano Zapata, Augusto Sandino, Ferrabundo Marti, and more recently, Ernesto Che Guevara have assumed in the revolutionary imagination of the last 30 years. If we think of all these examples, and many others we might cite, Benjamin's assertion that struggles are inspired more by the living, concrete memory of enslaved ancestors than by the, as yet abstract, thought of generations to come appears less paradoxical. The collective memory of the defeated differs from the various state pantheons to the glory of national heroes, not just by the nature of the figure concerned or their message and their position in the field of social conflict, but also by the fact that it has, in Benjamin's view, a subversive significance, only insofar it is, as it is not exploited in the service of any form of power. It is clear the remembrance of victims is not, for him, either a melancholic Jeremiad or a mystical meditation. It has meaning only if it becomes a source of moral and spiritual energy for those in struggle today. This is the dialectic between past and present already suggested by Thesis 9, and it is of significance, particularly for the fight against fascism, which draws its strength from the tradition of the oppressed. During a conversation with Brecht on the crimes of the Nazis in 1938, Benjamin notes, while he was speaking like this, I felt a power being exercised over me which was equal in strength to the power of fascism a power that sprang from depths of history no less deep than the power of the fascists. To avoid misunderstandings, it may be helpful to go back to the terms hatred and vengeance used by Benjamin. We may wonder whether he is not, in using these terms, responding implicitly to Nietzsche. As we know, Nietzsche applied the term resentment to the thirst for vengeance and hatred of the oppressed, the downtrodden, and the enslaved. From, from his aristocratic point of view, theirs was a slave revolt in morals based on envy, rancor, and impotence, which had its origin among the Jews, that priestly people of resentment par excellence. For Benjamin, the emotions of the oppressed, far from being the expression of an envious resentment or an impotent rancor, are a source of action, of active revolt, of revolutionary praxis. The concept of hatred refers above all to indignation at past and present suffering and to unyielding hostility to, to oppression, particularly in its latest and most terrifying manifestation, fascism. One cannot struggle against the Third Reich, Benjamin seems to be saying, without a profound aversion for Nazism, whose roots are sunk in past struggles. Like Marx in Capital, Benjamin is not preaching hatred of individuals, but of a system. As for avenging past victims, this can only mean the reparation of the wrong they suffered and the moral condemnation of those who inflicted it. The Oxford English Dictionary defines vengeance as the retri retri ret retributive infliction of injury or punishment. When we are speaking of an offense committed centuries or millennia ago, only moral punishment can be inflicted. Benjamin would not dream of avenging Spartacus and his comrades by punishing the Italian citizens of the 20th century. 
On the other hand, the overthrow of fascism, which presented itself as the heir to the Roman Empire, would also be a vengeance of history for the crucified slaves and a challenge to the victory of the Roman patricians. The important point for the author of the theses is that the last enslaved class, the proletariat, should perceive itself as heir to several centuries or millennia of struggle, to the lost battles of the slaves, serfs, peasants, and artisans. The accumulated force of these endeavors becomes the explosive material with which the present emancipatory class will be able to interrupt the continuity of oppression. Thesis 12 appeals to two great historical witnesses to support its argument. The first is Spartacus, or rather the Spartacus League, founded by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, which in January 1919 assumed the leadership of a spontaneous workers' uprising in Berlin that was bloodily crushed by Gustav Noski, the Social Democratic Interior Minister. The aspect Benjamin stresses is the historical consciousness manifested in the name of the organization, the modern proletariat as heir to the slaves who rebelled against the Roman Empire. In this way, the 1919 revolt becomes a moment in a universal battle that has lasted for thousands of years and not, as often depicted, a mere manifestation of post-war German domestic politics. The other figure is August Blanke, at the sound of whose name the preceding century had quaked. As a character, Blanke, that grand Vainsu, locked away in the prison cells of monarchies, republics, and empires for decades, without ceasing to embody the staunchest revolutionary opposition to the existing order, fascinated Benjamin. The German text speaks not just of the sound of his name, but of its Erzklang, its sounding out like brass, and this is doubtless a reference to the toxin, the alarm bell this armed prophet figuratively sounded to warn the oppressed of imminent catastrophe. Benjamin is interested not just in the historical figure, but also in the thinker, whose ideas were familiar to him from the splendid biography by Gustav Jeff Jeffrey. In defining the proletarians as modern slaves, Blanke reveals a conception of history similar to that of the Spartacists, and he was indeed a staunch adversary of positivism and the ideologies of progress. In his book, Jeffrey quotes some remarks by Blanke from 1862. I am not one of those who claim that progress can be taken for granted, that humanity cannot go backwards. No, there is no inevitability. Otherwise, the history of humanity, which is written hour by hour, would be entirely written in advance. It was perhaps with remarks of this kind in mind that Benjamin emphasized in a passage in Central Park that the activities of a professional conspirator like Blanke certainly do not presuppose any belief in progress. They merely presuppose a determination to do away with present injustice. This firm resolve to snatch humanity at the last moment from the catastrophe looming at every turn is characteristic of Blanke. In the French translation Benjamin himself made of theses, there is a last sentence that is absent from the German text. Our generation has learnt this to its cost, since the only image it is going to leave behind is that of a defeated generation. That will be its legacy to those who come after. This shows explicitly and directly that when he speaks of the defeated of history, he is thinking also of himself and his generation. This casts light on the stimming, the mood of the theses as a whole, as is suggested in one of his last letters addressed to his friend S. Lackner on May 5th, 1940. I've just finished a little essay on the concept of history a work inspired not just by the new war, but by the whole experience of my generation, which must be one of the most sorely tried in history. In the same spirit, in one of the preparatory notes, he mentions Brecht's famous poem, To Those Born Later, in which the writer calls on coming generations to remember the suffering of his own. Benjamin adds this poignant commentary, we ask of those who will come after us not gratitude for our victories, but the remembrance of our defeats. 
This is a consolation, the only consolation afforded to those who no longer have any hope of being consoled. Thesis 13. Every day our cause becomes clearer and people get smarter. This is a quote from Social Democratic Philosophy by Joseph Ditskin. Social democratic theory, and to an even greater extent its practice, were shaped by a conception of progress which bore little relation to reality, but made dogmatic claims. Progress as pictured in the minds of the social democrats was, first of all, progress of humankind itself, and not just advances in human ability and knowledge. Second, it was something boundless, in keeping with an infinite perfectibility of humanity. Third, it was considered inevitable something that automatically pursued a straight or spiral course. Each of these assumptions is controversial and open to criticism, but when the chips are down, criticism must penetrate beyond these assumptions and focus on what they have in common. The concept of mankind's historical progress cannot be sundered from the concept of its progression through a homogeneous, empty time. A critique of the concept of such progression must underlie any criticism on the concept of progress itself. The epigraph from Ditskin, chosen once again as an ideal typical example of limited, unimaginative social democratic progressis progressism, provides an illustration of an optimistic linear view of history, fueled by a superficial reading of the Ofklarung the irresistible, uninterrupted ascent of enlightenment and intelligence. The tragic reality of fascism gives the lie to this type of popul populistically tinged self-mystification. Let us develop the three critiques, which the thesis does not expand upon, but which are based on an alternative view of history. 1. We must distinguish between the progress of knowledge and of capabilities, and the progress of humanity itself. This latter involves a moral, social, and political dimension that is not reducible to scientific, technical progress. The movement of history is necessarily heterogeneous. In the history of the Russian Revolution, a book Benjamin knew well, Trotsky would say its development was uneven and combined, and advances in one dimension of civilization may be accompanied by regressions in another as Thesis 11 had already noted. 2. If one wishes for the progress of humankind itself, one cannot trust to a process of gradual, infinite improvement, but must struggle for a radical break, the end of the age-old history of oppression, or, in Marxian language, the end of prehistory. We should add that Benjamin does not use the expression end of prehistory himself, but here refers somewhat elliptically, it must be said, to the possible coming of the real state of emergency, or more precisely, state of exception. Framing the issue in this way avoids evolutionism and teleology insofar as what, it, what is at issue here is an aim being struggled for and an objective possibility, not the inevitable outcome of the laws of history. And indeed, as Benjamin writes in one of the most striking formulations in the Arcades Project, what our generation has learned that capitalism will not die a natural death. Three, there is therefore no automatic or continuous progress. The only continuity is that of domination and the automatism of history merely reproduces this, the rule. The only moments of freedom are interruptions, discontinuities, when the oppressed rise up and attempt to free themselves. To be effective, this critique of progressive doctrines has to attack their common foundation, their deepest root, their hidden quintessence, the dogma of an homogeneous, empty temporality. In the following theses, we shall see what this concept means and the alternative Benjamin proposes, namely qualitative, heterogeneous, full time. The stakes in this debate are far from purely theoretical and philosophical. At issue, stresses Benjamin, is a certain practical attitude that combines the optimism of progress with an absence of initiative, passivity, and attentism. An attitude which, as we have seen in connection with Thesis 11, finds its tragic denouement in the German left's cap capitulation of 
without a fight to Hitler in 1933, or to give an example Benjamin does not mention, but which was nonetheless in his mind at the point when he was drafting the theses of most of the French left's capitulation to Pétain in 1940. Thesis 14. Origin is the goal. That single very short sentence is a quotation from Words in Verse by Karl Kraus. History is the subject of a construction whose site is not homogeneous, empty time, but time filled full by now time. Thus, to Robespierre, ancient Rome was a past charged with now time, a past which he blasted out of the continuum of history. The French Revolution viewed itself as Rome reincarnate. It cited ancient Rome exactly the way fashion cites a bygone mode of dress. Fashion has a nose for the topical, no matter where it stirs in the thickets of long ago. It is the tiger's leap into the past. Such a leap, however, takes place in an arena where the ruling class gives the commands. The same leap in the open air of history is the dialectical leap Marx understood as revolution. In a letter to Horkheimer written in 1941, shortly after receiving a copy of the theses, Adorno compared the conception of time of Thesis 14 with Paul Tillich's Kairos. The Christian socialist Tillich, a close collaborator of the Frankfurt Institute of Social Research of the 20s and 30s, contrasted Kairos, full historical time, in which each moment contains a unique opportunity, a singular constellation between relative and absolute, with Chronos, formal time. Karl Krauss's epigraph, Ursprung ist der Ziel, has a double meaning. From the theological standpoint, redemption, as we have seen above, brings a return to the lost paradise. Tikin apocatastasis, the restitu restitutio omnium. And this is indeed what Benjamin himself wrote in his article on Karl Kraus, in which he glosses this remark by the Viennese writer in the following terms. He calls the world a wrong, deviating, circuitous way back to paradise. From the, pol from the political viewpoint, the revolution is also a return to the original paradise. But in thesis 14, Benjamin is concerned with another type of relation to the past, a relation that might be termed revolutionary quotation. How in this context are we to interpret this surprising comparison between fashion and revolution? An observation in the Arcades project helps us to understand this parallel. The two apparently proceed in the same way. While the French Revolution cites Roman antiquity, late 18th century fashion cites Greek antiquity, but the temporality of fashion is that of hell. While cultivating the absurd superstition of the new, it is the eternal repetition of the same, endlessly and uninterruptedly. It thus serves the ruling classes as camouflage to conceal the great aversion to violent changes. Revolution, by contrast, is the interruption of the eternal return and the coming of the most profound change. It is a dialectical leap outside of the continuum, first towards the past and then towards the future. The tiger's leap into the past consists in rescuing the heritage of the oppressed and drawing inspiration from it in order to break into and halt the present catastrophe. The past contains presentness, Jeitzzeit, a term variously translated into English as now time and time of the now. And a variant of thesis 14, Jeitzzeit, is defined as an explosive to which historical materialisms add or to which historical material materialism adds the fuse. The aim is to explode the continuum of history with the aid of a conception of historical time that perceives it as full, as charged with present, explosive, subversive moments. For Robespierre, the Roman Republic was charged with now time with that jet site the French Republic needed in 1793. Wrenched out of its context, it becomes an explosive to be used in the battle against the monarchy 
by interrupting a thousand years of royal continuity in the history of Europe. The present revolution feeds on the past, the way the tiger feeds on what he finds in the forest. But the link is a fleeting, fragile one, forming only a momentary constellation that has to be seized. Hence the image of the wild beasts leap in time. Republican heroes like Brutus figure among the victims of the past, among the defeated of imperial history, that history that is written as a succession of the victory parades of the Caesars. As such, these heroes can be cited by the French revolutionaries as eminently topical references. As is well known, Marx had roundly criticized the Roman illusions of the Jacobins in the 18th premiere. Benjamin, who could not be unaware of that famous text, here takes the opposite stance to the founder of historical materialism. In our view, he was both wrong and right to do so. He was wrong first because the Roman Republic, a slave-holding patrician state, could in no sense provide inspiration for the democratic ideals of 1793. And it is indeed amazing that Benjamin does not mention, rather than Robespierre, the example of Gracchus Babeuf, who did not quote ancient Rome, but the tribunes of the Roman plebes. The Roman phantasmagorias of the Jacobins were indeed, as Marx had shown, an illusion, but the author of the 18th Brumaire went too far in concluding that proletarian revolutions, unlike the bourgeois ones, could derive their poetry only from the future and not from the past. Benjamin's profound intuitive sense of the explosive presence of the emancipatory moments of the past and the revolutionary culture of the present was right. For example, the presence of the 1793 to 94 commune in the Paris commune of 1871 and of the latter in the October revolution of 1917. In each case, and one could cite many more examples both in Europe and in Latin America, the revolutionary uprising performed a tiger's leap into the past, a dialectical jump under the clear sky of history, but taking as its own an explosive moment from the past, charged with now time. The quotation of the past was not necessarily a constraint or an illusion, but could be a tremendous source of inspiration, a powerful cultural weapon in the present battle. In another preparatory note, Benjamin contrasts the historical continuum, which is the creation of the oppressors, with tradition, which is that of the oppressed. The tradition of the oppressed, mentioned in Thesis 8, as the source of the true understanding of fascism, is, in Benjamin's view, one of the three chief aspects of historical materialism, alongside the discontinuity of historical time and the destructive force of the working class. This tradition is discontinuous. It is made up of exceptional explosive moments in the interminable succession of forms of oppression. But dialectically, it has its own continuity to the image of the explosion, that is to shatter the continuum of oppression. There corresponds within the tradition of the oppressed, the metaphor of weaving. According to the essay on Fuchs, we must weave into the warp of the present the threads of a tradition that have been lost for centuries. Thesis 15. What characterizes revolutionary classes at their moment of action is the awareness that they are about to make the continuum of history explode the Great Revolution introduced a new calendar. The initial day of the calendar presents history in time-lapse mode. And, basically, it is this same day that keeps recurring in the guise of holidays, which are days of remembrance. Thus, calendars do not measure time the way clocks do. They are monuments of a historical consciousness of which not the slightest trace has been apparent in Europe, it would seem, for the past hundred years. In the July Revolution, an incident occurred in which this consciousness came into its own. On the first evening of fighting, it so happened that the dials on clock towers were being fired at simultaneously and independently from several locations in Paris. An eyewitness who may have owed his insight to the rhyme wrote as follows. Who would believe it? It is said that, incensed at the hour, latter-day Joshua's at the foot of every clock tower were firing on clock faces to make the day stand still. Um, 
it rhymes in French. <laughs> Not so much in English. Revolutionary classes, that is to say not only the proletariat, but all the oppressed of the past, are aware of blowing historical continuity apart by their action. In fact, only revolutionary action can interrupt for a time the triumphal procession of the victors. In peasant uprising, medieval heretical revolts, or the peasant war of the 16th century, this awareness took the chiliastic or apocalyptic form of the end of time and the coming of the millennium. Benjamin doubtless knew his friend Ernst Bloch's book on Thomas Munzer. In the French Revolution, a model that remains a constant reference for Benjamin throughout his life, this same awareness manifests itself in the introduction of a new calendar, starting from the day on which the Republic is proclaimed. 1793 was year one of the new era. The day a new calendar comes into force is, writes Benjamin, histor richer Zeitreffer, an untranslatable concept which one of Benjamin's French translators, Pierre Missick, renders wrongly as le, le rythme de l'histoire saxillaire, and another, Maurice de Gandillac, translates literally as un ramasseur historique du temps. In his own translation, Benjamin proposes une sorte de raccourci historique, i.e. a sort of historical shortcut, and he explains this as follows. The first new day incorporates into itself the whole of preceding time. Why is this the case? Perhaps because in that day all the moments of past revolt and the full wealth of the tradition of the oppressed find themselves gathered up. This is what Benjamin suggests when he observes in one of his preparatory notes that in the break in historical continuity, revolution, both tradition and a new begin beginning coincide. But the expression historischer Zeitreffer remains enigmatic. For Benjamin, calendars represent the opposite of empty time. They are the expression of a historic heterogeneous time freighted with memory and presentness. Holidays are qualitatively distinct from other days. They are days of memory and remembrance that express a real historical consciousness. They are, as the French version has it, aussi bien des jours initiaux que des jours de souvenance. As much initial days as days of remembrance. The word initial here referring to an emancipatory or redemptive rupture. The Jewish calendar provides an obvious example of this, which Benjamin doubtless had in mind when writing these lines. The main holidays in that calendar are given over to the remembrance of redemptive events. The flight from Egypt, Pesach, the revolt of the Maccabees, Hanukkah, the rescue of the exiles in Persia, Purim. The imperative of memory, Zachar, is even one of the central elements of the ritual of the Jewish Passover. You are to remember your ancestors in Egypt as though you had yourself been a slave in those times. We may, however, cite other secular holidays such as the French 14th of July or the Workers' May Day, initial days of popular celebration and revolutionary memory, constantly under threat from the conformism that seeks to take hold of them. Thesis 15 continues the critique of the two preceding theses against the homogeneous conception of time but it identifies this empty temporality more precisely as clock time. It is the purely mechanical, automatic, quantitative, ever self-identical time of the timepiece. A time reduced to space. Industrial capitalist civilization has been increasingly dominated since the 19th century by clock time, which can be exactly measured in a strictly quantifiable way. The pages of Marx's Capital are filled with terrifying examples of the tyranny of the clock over workers' lives. In pre-capitalist societies, time bore qualitative significance, but with the advance of the process of industrialization, this gradually gave way to the dominance of clock time alone. For Benjamin, historical time cannot be likened to clock time. This is a theme that goes back to his earliest writings. In the article, Charles Beale, and tragedy of 1916, 
He contrasts historical time filled with messianic temporality with the empty mechanical time of clocks. A few years later, in his thesis on the concept of criticism in German Romanticism, he contrasts the qualitative temporal infinity of Romantic messianism with the empty temporal infinity of the ideologies of progress. The conception of time proposed by Benjamin has its sources in the Jewish messianic tradition. For the Hebrews, time was not an empty abstract linear category, but was inseparable from its content. It is, however, in a way traditional, pre-capitalist or pre-industrial cultures as a whole that retain in their calendars and festivals traces of the historical consciousness of time. The act of the revolutionaries firing on the clocks during the revolution of July 1830 represents that consciousness so far as Benjamin is concerned. But here it is not the calendar clashing with the clock. It is the historical time of revolution assailing the mechanical time of the timepiece. The revolution is the attempt to arrest empty time by the eruption of qualitative messianic time, the way that Joshua, according to the Old Testament, halted the course of the sun to gain the time he needed for victory. In Benjamin's Baudelaire, we also find a reference to Joshua in this aspiration to stop the march of time, to interrupt the course of the world that was Baudelaire's deepest intention the intention of Joshua. He is speaking both of a messianic and a revolutionary interruption of the, cat the catastrophic course of the world. In July 1830, the revolutionary classes, like latter-day Joshua's, were still aware that their action blasted apart the historical continuity of oppression. A recent Latin American example strikingly transposes this aspiration onto the terrain of symbolism of protest rather than revolution. During popular protest demonstrations mounted by the workers and peasants trade union organizations and by black and indigenous movements against the official governmental celebrations of the 500th anniversary of the discovery of Brazil by the Portuguese navigators in 1500, a group of natives shot arrows at the clock sponsored by the Glue Television Network counting down the days and hours to the centenary. Thesis 16. The historical materialist cannot do without the notion of a present, which is not a transition, but in which time takes a stand and has come to a standstill. For this notion defines the present in which he himself is writing history. Historicism offers the eternal image of the past. Historical materialism supplies a unique experience with the past. The historical materialist leaves it to others to be drained by the horror called once upon a time in historicism's bordello. He remains in control of his powers, man enough to blast open the continuum of history. Pursuing his polemic against historicism, Benjamin formulates a curious allegory. We may interpret it as follows. The prostitute called once upon a time in const in the bordello historicism receives the victors one after another. She has no qualms about giving herself to one and then abandoning him the next moment and taking another. The succession of these victors forms the continuum of history. Once upon a time there was Julius Caesar. Once upon a time, there was Charlemagne. Once upon a time, there was the Borgia Pope, and so on. By contrast, the historical materialist, who contrary to what Benjamin implies, does not have, have to be of the masculine gender, man enough, has a unique experience with an image of the past. The essay on Fuchs, which contains a kind of variant of thesis 16, explains that it is a matter of perceiving, as it flashes before us, to use the language of Thesis 5, the critical connection a particular fragment forms with a particular present. For example, between Walter Benjamin in a moment of supreme danger in 1940 and August Blanky, the prisoner, the forgotten revolutionary, or again in the work by Bloch mentioned above, between the revolutionary risings in Germany in 1919-21, that present in which he himself is writing history. 
and the Peasant Uprising, inspired by Thomas Munzer. For that constellation to be able to form, the present must, nevertheless, come to a standstill for a moment. This is the equivalent at the histori 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 historiographic fuck historiographical level sorry of the revolutionary interruption of historical continuity according to the essay on fuchs the unique experience with the past liberates the immense forces bound up in historicisms once upon a time in other words while the conformist pseudo-objective approach of writers like ranke and sybil neutralizes and sterilizes the images of the past, the approach of historical materialism recovers the hidden explosive energies that are to be found in a precise moment of history. These energies, which are those of the jet site, are like the spark produced by a short circuit enabling the continuum of history to be blasted apart. A topical example from, La from Latin America, the Zepit Zapatist uprising of the Chiapas in January 1994 strikingly illustrates Benjamin's ideas. There, by a tiger's leap into the past, the native fighters of the EZLN liberated the explosive energies of the legend of Emiliano Zapata by wresting it from the conformism of official history and by blasting apart the alleged historical continuity between the Mexican Revolution of 1911-17 to and the corrupt authoritarian regime of the PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party.